Welcome to Fort Knox. Once again, I am John Fort here this time with Julia Hartz, the co-founder and CEO of Eventbrite. And uh, I mean, I always start off asking about today's toughest problem, and I don't presume to know what it is, but you are in the events space and it's been challenging lately. It has. I mean, I think that the toughest problem I and the rest of my colleagues around the world are solving is something that we're all experiencing, which is social isolation. I think that over the last year and a half, we've experienced a life that we never even imagined could exist. And part of that is not being able to go out and be with uh, other people in real life, feeling that energy and that passion. And so, you know, for us, the, the so social isolation part and the, and the ongoing impacts of that and the stress are certainly the, the challenge and the problem that we're trying to solve. And, you know, we thought we were coming out of it and the Delta variant keeps pulling us uh, back in. But you guys just reported earnings also. And it's interesting. Um, th there is demand for uh, smaller venues, smaller creators who are hosting events that still uh, continues to come back. And of course, you guys ticket not just in-person events, but also uh, digital virtual events. How has that process e evolved over the past year and a half? And how do you expect the trends to carry forward from here? Yeah, so starting from you know the beginning of 2020, so we came into the year with a million creators using Eventbrite. And when I say creators, I know that word is widely used now, but this is these are live experience creators for small and medium sized businesses who bring people together for their business. And Eventbrite has done a great job of being a horizontal platform that really acts like their operating system that gives them the tools they need to reach a big audience to convert that audience into event goers, to sell tickets to events. So if you think about it as a Shopify for small merchants, Eventbrite is that for small to medium sized event creators. And so, you know, we really thought about the world uh, as, as this moment of enablement to help our creators not only thrive during this great disruption where restriction, res, restrictions on gatherings were very real and very, um, you know, business disrupting, but also think about what they could do with their communities. And what was really incredible was the sort of immediate pivot to taking the same type of event content and making that a virtual experience for people, especially when we were all locked in our homes and, and really yearning to be together and connect with one another. I think that was a new business opportunity that opened up for our customers, and we've just taken that torch and run with it. And so as we look at 2021, which is a very different year than 2020, you know, this, this is more of a hybrid business. We're seeing the shift back to in-person for sure. I mean, I think Q2 was a bellwether for the recovery of in-person events when cases are low and restrictions do ease. But we're also seeing a lot of strength in online events. And we're actually seeing the same creator, that same core customer, host both in-person, local, and unique events that are, you know, on average less than 50 attendees, $40 average ticket price for an, you know, an event that's maybe in the next two weeks. And they're also hosting these big, larger gatherings with the same content for a global audience of people who wouldn't normally ever be able to go to that event. Right. Now, I, I can't help but notice during the pandemic that it, it's forced me and as a creator of sorts, not necessarily an event creator uh, for most of the time, but to focus on digital process, right? So if there's any kind of appointment, uh, whether it's a gathering or not, I'm a lot more conscious about who is it, what's my contact with that person, where are we gathering, how many people are they coming, do they know where it is? There's a sort of documentation that Eventbrite also does uh, about things besides the ticketing process and the financial transaction that I imagine have a different value when people and businesses are a lot more conscious about having data and having good processes that work whether you've, you're hosting a digital event or a physical one. Am I, am I right there? I think you're spot on. You know, our business has always been about bringing creators who were previously offline or using some sort of cobble together 
solution and bringing them online and giving them a platform that could effectively be that operating system for their business. It's the front door, it's the back office. And never before has it been more important for them to actually capture that digital record, whether it's for contact tracing or it's for gathering you know, automated waivers for entrance into an in-person event, or it's communicating safety protocol, um, whether it's offering refunds and credits, which is a reality in the business that we're well equipped to help them handle, or it's taking that same audience and converting them into a virtual community that meets online. We've seen some really interesting things come out of this, this moment in time. I mean, I, I feel like Eventbrite, the business, and Eventbrite creators are living in parallel, right? Which is sort of everybody's best dream that, that you're intrinsically linked with your customer. But as we're watching these entrepreneurial creators start to figure out new ways to build their businesses, we're in a fast follow mode building product that's making that better and faster and more efficient. And so part mm. of that is the way in which they're thinking about their hybrid business model moving forward. Right. You're in a way part of the hospitality uh, industry or, or food chain, at least, because a lot of the locations where events get hosted are part of the hospitality industry. It's about gathering people together. And in travel and hospitality, it's been a really tough time to manage, to manage costs, even, um, you know, during the past year and a half, as events have slowed down, revenues have slowed Talk to me as a manager, as a CEO, what you had to do in the business as that happened, um, when it comes to employees, when it comes to costs, and what mode you're in now. Well, certainly in March of 2020, it was a, it was a swift hit. There was no time to wonder whether or not COVID would impact our business. Once the CDC started to put out recommendations about restricting gathering, which was the for the greater good of public health, we knew that we would we would be facing a really difficult time and you know i think one benefit one silver lining of having that massive and immediate of a disruption is that it doesn't give you any time to to hesitate and we didn't so within a month of covid uh you know impacting our business and our creators businesses we had completely realigned the strategy by asking ourselves if we could do it all over again, what would we do? Having the wisdom that we had in, in operating the business for over a decade. And then we restructured the company to fit that North Star. And, you know, it, it, it was a lot of long nights, sleepless nights, a lot of hardship to get to where we were in probably by June of, of last year, we were just in complete fighting shape and ready to to sprint and to develop the best product for our creators and their, you know, rapidly changing needs now. But it was dark. It was tough. And and you know, I think so many business leaders have gone through that experience. So it's not unique, but I think Eventbrite really did an incredible job as a team coming out of this in just much stronger shape. You know, this last quarter that we just reported by all accounts shows the impact of the decisions that we made back in Q2 of 2020 in the midst of the chaos and the uncertainty. And it, it yielded a much more profitable business. Uh, we ticketed a record number of events last quarter, 1.5 million events. So it also signaled that when events start to come back, they come back strong and there's a huge amount of, of attending demand for our customers, which is good news. Yeah. I, I, one thing that, is unique, I think, about what happened a year and a half ago was that it was universal, not just not just in a certain geographic area, not just in a certain market, not just in a certain country. Um, it was global. And so um, within Silicon Valley, within your communities of leaders, of tech workers, however you define your communities, how did you navigate that um, both as a leader and then just... <laughs> You know, as a as a person with all kinds of um, re responsibilities, because it was because it was universal. Well, I think that the way I approached it was by compartmentalizing and <laughs> prioritizing. That sounds so dry, but that's basically what my brain does when it kicks into overdrive. And so, first and foremost, it was about taking care of what we call our bright links. So, you know, we're a tech company, so of course we've got to call ourselves something cute. Uh, our Brightlings were 
around the world in 12 different offices. And, you know, I think the hardest part about that time is captured actually quite well in Michael Lewis's new book, The Premonition, because it was as if some of us had information that other people either hadn't really internalized yet or didn't have access to. And so there was that sort of week long period of just total uh, utter confusion. And it was our job to really communicate to our Brightlings how we were going to be able to operate in a fully remote setting when we had really relied on and and I think done a great job of building an in-office culture that was a hallmark of the Eventbrite experience. The second thing was our creators. So we needed to let them know the disruption that was coming. And that was a really difficult job to try to communicate that. And that was job number two. Job number three was the business. So we actually ended up processing negative revenue in March of 2020. I think wow. there are very few companies that can, can claim that. Ne <laughs> negative revenue company. because you had to give refunds or because you chose to give refunds? Absolutely. I mean, it was it was basically, if you think about Eventbrite, the ticket engine is a is a huge engine operating at scale. Hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions are happening and all of a sudden you have to flip that engine in reverse. You know, and, and we acted really quickly because we value our customers, our creators, the, the supply side, and we really value our consumers. And we wanted to help them establish the closest communication they possibly could. And because of that, we had to give our creators a way to quickly refund for events that weren't going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So I think that like, um, by compartmentalizing and prioritizing, it allowed us to really get to work. And there were about 50 people internally who had leadership positions in one of these buckets. You know, part of the business of the business challenge was, okay, we need to shore up our own costs. There's a huge opportunity to accelerate a new strategy and realign toward that. Let's not let that go to waste. But we also needed to get new capital in the door to ensure that we could see ourselves through any duration of recovery of which in March we were projecting, you know, worst case scenario, 48 months. So I think we were on the like sort of extreme side of, okay, this is going to be bad and it's going to be bad for a while. That's a good thing that you were on that extreme end mm -hmm. uh, in March because I know a lot of people were thinking, oh, this will be over by the end of summer in the fall, we'll be back. But you you knew better. Well, I think we, we all hoped that we were going to be wrong. But I think the people around us and, and, you know, my own intuition was that I'd rather be wrong about it, about, I'd rather be way conservative and be wrong, right? Like I would rather give money back than, than lose the company that my husband and I and our third co-founder built 15 years ago. I mean, it, it certainly emotionally as a founder, it felt like my firstborn was in the ICU. Right. Yeah. Um, well, and the ticketing uh, portion uh, is coming back as your uh, last earnings demonstrated. And of course, we might go through various ups and downs and head fakes with variants and whatnot. Um, and we'll get back to talking about the business currently and the plans for the future. But now I want um, to go back. Uh, and talk about you um, a bit more. Um, and I like to start at the very beginning. So uh, let's talk about where were you born, uh, parents, household, what was that like? Siblings? All right. <laughs> I was born in a small beach town called Santa Cruz here in the Bay Area. And I have an older brother who's five years older than me and we're best friends. And I was dedicated entirely to dance. I grew up as a ballerina. So I was not the kid that had the lemonade stand and was sort of doing the entrepreneurial ventures. I was fully focused on my craft. And, uh, you know, that was my life, was, was my family, friends, and dance. And you say dance. Was it specifically ballet or various different it was competitive dance. It was um, a, a mixture of lyrical, contemporary, hip hop, ballet, but I was on a competitive dance team. So we would travel around and, and compete in uh, these different conventions 
that's taken on a whole new life since Dance Moms. This was way pre-Dance Moms. <laughs> but, but still, that, that requires a lot of focus and discipline and physical training. I mean, dance is really, really hard. Uh, what did you get from that? Well, I mean, I, I trained between 12 to 15 hours a week, which takes on my, my daughter is taking the same path right now. And it takes on a whole new meaning when you're the parent supporting the, the dancer. Um, so I, I realized how much it was now. Um, but back then it was just my life. I went to school and I danced. But you're right. So much of who I am today is because of the constant feedback loop you have as a performer the discipline that you have to have to get better and to win, frankly, and the and the performance, um, you know, quality of it all. The fact that you know, one of my earliest lessons as a kid was the show must go on, and that was mm -hmm. so ingrained in me by you know my studio owner and teachers that um, I do sometimes look back at that and really can see like, well, that's part of why I'm who I am today. Right. Well, what what kind of a performer were you? Um, I, I know a lot of times people who do dance might also do other types of performance or be interested in entertainment in general. Were you one of those kind of clutch people who, you know, would take it to another level when, you know, the spotlight is on and it's showtime? Were you one of those people who felt that, boy, I really, really need to to drill everything and have everything 110% perfect because my performance maybe comes down a little bit when the pressure's on? What? Totally reverse. So I'm a horrible rehearser. And when the lights go on, I go to 11. So it was, that, that, was, that was my life. Nobody's ever asked me that question, John. And it's so true. It was just, and you know, and I was, I was rock solid in, in sort of always delivering. Um, but I had an incredible partner in, uh, her name's Katie Weber. She's actually been on Broadway for about 25 years now. And, uh, you know, I think, I think I was her support. She was the real star. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked that that way I was into, uh, drama and, you know, played a little piano and things like that and sang growing up. And I was the type who also, I think, took it up a level when the lights were on. And my youngest is like that. Like he's... You know, when it's time to practice, he might be, uh, but he's super serious when it's, you know, recital time. Uh, does that translate uh, to business since then? Absolutely. I think especially when it comes to, to, you know, press engagements, I'm a horrible, you know, before the interview practice person. Like it just, I think I drive everyone around me nuts because it's just hard for me to engage in a mock interview versus talking to the, to the person. I, I'm just... I, I operate on this level of I need to feel the energy of the other person to really understand what it is we're doing, right? So of course there are times when you have to block it out because it's, <laughs> the energy's not working. But I think something like this conversation just it's just completely different when you're doing it live, when you're doing it in the moment. And so I think I've had to um, learn and try to teach myself the discipline of applying some of that practice from my previous life into my craft today. And especially with things like earnings calls, you know, it becomes pretty routine. But when you're bad, you're really bad. And when you're great, you're good. So you kind of have to always be great and be like finding that moment of, okay, this is what I want to work on next. This is how I want to improve. And the way that I operate in everything that I do is that I'm just a constant work in progress. And I'm okay with that. If I didn't have something to get better or something to achieve next, I think I would, I would get, I would get demotivated. I wouldn't even just get bored. I just would, would feel pretty, you know, not, not like, not alive, I guess. I mean, yeah, it sounds like the, the growth mindset concept in practice um, outside of dance, your kid growing up, Santa Cruz, uh, it's an area that I know decently well, lived in the Bay Area for about 13 years and, you know, awesome. the boardwalk and the, and the stuff and the laid back attitude a lot of times in Santa Cruz. What, what else were you into, even academically, um, outside of dance? Well, I think that I was always into narrative, whether it be, you know, social studies or beyond dance. I did musical theater at the local college, uh, history. You know, there were always the, the subjects that like really drew me in were the ones that had a strong 
narrative. And I think that that led to me figuring out what I wanted to do first in my career. I also interned at the local news station for Dina Ruiz when she was our local news anchor. And that's what turned me on to my first career aspiration because of course, I was just focused on becoming a backup dancer for Janet Jackson, which is my absolute all time life dream that I have not, I have not fulfilled. And my parents, you know, they had other, they're like, hey, you could do that after you go to college. So I sort of had this moment where I had to, you know, I had to realign around, well, what would I do while I'm still working towards my ultimate dream? Right. Like what can you do during the day when you're backup dancing for Janet yeah. Jackson becomes yeah. the, yeah. Um, and so that, that college um, push that you were getting, well, where did you end up going? What did you end up studying? So I ended up going to Pepperdine University, which is a small private liberal arts college down the coast in Malibu. And for me, I wanted to stay close to home. I'm incredibly close to my family. We all now live within a few miles of each other here. And I wanted to be by the beach because when you do grow up in Santa Cruz, that's not a luxury. It feels like a necessity to be able to see the water. I wanted to go to a small school and I wanted to you know, explore this craft. I thought I wanted to be a, a news broadcaster. And so after I had this experience with Dina, that's sort of where, you know, at, at this age, I was 17 when I went to college. I feel like it's a little bit young to figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life, but I at least knew what I wanted to learn more about. And Pepperdine was a perfect match for that. They had a, they have a working television studio. They're close enough to Los Angeles. So you could do some really interesting internships and small. Um, and I got in early acceptance and then I did not receive any financial aid. And I was sort of right stuck in that middle of not qualifying for financial aid. And it would have crippled my, my family to try to send me there without financial aid. So this was one of the most important moments of my life. I resigned myself to going to a, a, a different school and was about to sign the contract. And my mom said to me, you know, I can tell that you really still feel like you should be going to Pepperdine. You should write them a letter and tell them that. And I'm like, mom, hmm. mom. <laughs> my, my, my kids will be like, mom, what are you talking about? <laughs> I sat down and I wrote the letter and I sent it off. And two weeks later, out of nowhere, a huge packet arrived and it was a full financial aid package for Pepperdine. It included me signing my life away, you know, working, working for free for the communications department for four years of which I did on top of having two paying jobs and an unpaid internship. But it was the support I needed. I graduated, oh. graduated with a bunch of student loans. I mean, it wasn't like a you know, fairy tale, but it was somebody read that letter and that actually changed the course of my entire life. And I still don't know who that person is. Yeah, I would. Th that's what I was going to ask is if you ever figured out who made that work. But what was the lesson that you took from that? It reminds me, it reminds me of something that my mom said to me probably around the same time, um, uh, maybe literally around the same time, when she said you get 50% of what you ask for, right? And, and the impact on me was like, oh, I need to ask for more things because I keep worrying about bothering people or or somehow you know having a bad batting average when it turn when it comes to getting things I ask for. And what she was in essence saying is, no, ask for everything that you think you might want to have. I I feel like that was the first time that this this resonated that your life could actually go in different directions because up until that point, I didn't have a lot of choice or agency in terms of my life. My, my parents were divorced, but they operated as a, as a team. And we sort of lived in this happy hippie commune type, <laughs> type, you know, setup. So I, I didn't have anything to complain about. Um, I had had a job since I was 14 making my own money. So, um, I was, I worked at the ugly mug as a barista. So I know how to make a good latte, but you know, other than that, I didn't have a lot of crossroads. And I think this was the first major crossroad. And what it taught me was exactly that. If you don't actually put your intention out there sincerely you're not actually going to get a return from the universe on you know what you're asking for um the only regret i have is to have found that person 
who had made that decision to tell them that they actually had changed my life in that moment. Yeah, you know, it seems like somebody with financial aid ought to be taking credit for that. Yeah, I recently wrote a LinkedIn post to see if I could find the person and and I can't, you know, I, I don't know that they would even remember that. So, you know, it's, it's but it's, um, but I hope they've, they've had good fortune uh, along their lives. So, you know, and then there's, there have been these other really pivotal moments where I've had to raise my hand and say, I, I think I can do this. I want this. Yeah, I, I want to talk more about that. But before we do that, you mentioned that you uh, worked as a teenager and um, hey, that's, that's important. Uh, and it's not as common now as it used to be. Why do you think that is? And now uh, you talked about looking at dance differently as a parent uh, than you did as you know somebody experiencing it. H how do you look at work? Well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head in terms of, of a, a chief concern I have about my own kid's path, right? So um, I, I worked because I wanted disposable income. I also worked because both of my parents, uh, all three of them rather, my mom, my dad, and my stepdad, all had incredible work ethics. My mom was an editor, my dad was a manager at Costco, and my stepdad is a retired fire captain. So all around me were people who really dedicated themselves to their work and taught me that same mode of operating just by example. And so, but when I look back now in my wise old years, I think a big part of my success has been the fact that I've been working since I was 14 because I have never taken a period of time off. And so I've always appreciated the value of hard work to the dollar. That is so different now with my, my daughter's 13. So she's coming up on that, on that point at which I actually went in, had a job interview, got the interview and worked every weekend. And so I'm really grappling with that because those opportunities don't actually seem to be available here for kids that age. And I don't know why. I haven't quite, maybe you know why, but I think we've changed the paradigm of what it means to be a kid. And there's so much more emphasis on building one's resume around sports or academics. And we're kind of missing the point altogether, which is, does the person know how to work? and the mm. importance of that, the importance of being punctual. Of I used to have this woman who would walk in every morning at 5.59 a.m. and tell me the latte that I made for her was horrible. I will <laughs> never forget that woman. And I realized on like the third week, after you know crying in the back room, I realized, oh my God, she just needs a friend and someone to talk to. And negative attention, apparently, I guess it was just part of her routine as she, you know, she needed to say, it was horrible. Uh, well, two, two questions. One, what did you want the disposable income for? And then two, uh, what, what do you remember? I was really early. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. as, as a teenager, you know, in yeah. the, yeah. Um, what did you want the disposable income for? And what was the moment that for you, you realized that the job was serious, whether it had to do with dealing with a customer or dealing with a manager that, okay, this, this work is different from chores. So honestly, the first thing that comes to mind when you say, what did I want to use the money for? Maroon bongo jeans at forever 21. I mean, at the local mall. So if that doesn't age sure. me, I don't know what, what else would. Most people are probably like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so I wanted to buy clothes. Uh, secondly, uh, the minute I walked in those front doors to have my orientation as a new employee, I knew this was so different. And here's why. It was a brand new coffee shop in a little part of Santa Cruz called SoCal. And it was on the corner and it was called The Ugly Mug. And the proprietor was passionate about great coffee. So he had this beautiful machine, fully manual, and this was his pride and joy. And it was a singular craft. It wasn't like a coffee shop trying to be something else. It was just about great coffee. And I'll never forget going in to learn how to make these drinks and how hard it was to get it right. And that taught me the importance of specificity 
of quality and of hospitality because there was a whole experience that you had coming into that coffee shop and it was quite unique. I mean, Santa Cruz is a place where you will find great coffee. <laughs> this was this was a, a totally new concept. You, you find a lot of unique things in Santa Cruz too. It's a, it's do, a culture place. You do. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, tell, tell me about how um, dance prepared you for that also, because when you're describing there was a whole process, I mean, memorizing process, you must have been used to that. You must have been used to, you know, at least some of the performative aspects of customer service and, you know, smiling at the woman who every day tells you that you made her a horrible cup of coffee, even though she's doing that and dealing with, you know, the, the emotional fallout backstage. Um, did, did it help? It did. I mean, I think that dance and my own just sort of way of operating set me up to be uh, incredibly adaptable, which is something I rely on today all the time. So I only need to learn something once. And yeah, I'm not proud of the mistakes that I can choose to continue making, <laughs> but I only need to learn a lesson once. And so it almost feels like I, I'm a sponge that's constantly taking in information and then making tweaks and adjustments. And so I think for me, it was about, you know, finding that point of connection with the woman. I realized after the third week, I actually would bring the newspaper with me. And because these were the days when you got the newspaper on your doorstep. So I'd pick it up. My mom would be so mad. She's like, I don't know where my Sunday paper is. I'd bring it with me and I'd open it to a story before the woman came in. And then while I was making the drink, I'd ask her what her thoughts were about the story. So we started to have this connection. And again, this woman probably does not remember this at all. But for me, it was so important because we started to have a connection that wasn't about the, the quality of the latte. It wasn't about that. You know, it was about her needing to have a connection with someone. And, and so I think that started to form for me, coping mechanisms to use my natural born empathy to connect with people and kind of get under what that surface level is to understand what is their why, where are they coming from? And that psychology part has actually helped me immensely throughout my entire career, but it really started at the ugly mug. Huh. And did, did she stop insulting your coffee? Eventually she did. She never stopped being cranky, but she <laughs> always asked for me when, when she came in and I wasn't there. <laughs> well, that's nice. Some people need, to be cranky, um, that's just, you know, they, yeah. they can't <laughs> otherwise. Um, you've talked about uh, kind of show business and answering the phone uh, at, at friends um, and, uh, you know, work in that side of things and how that led to you deciding to get out of that and into something else, starting Eventbrite when you and your husband were just engaged. Tell me about um, that process of shifting from uh, kind of content, performance uh, to business. How, how easy, how comfortable or uncomfortable is that transition? Well, I think, you know, stepping back, I think that like there's, there's a lot loaded into the word entrepreneur. <laughs> and I've, I've felt like an imposter for the last 15 years when people call me an entrepreneur because Again, I wasn't the one who was constantly seeking out new ideas. I think I'm an incredible operator. And I think that's what made makes Kevin and I a great team. But going through the process of being in the middle of Hollywood, I you know had a successful career in television development, allowed me to understand what it means to tell stories that evoke emotion. And I was really passionate about it. And, you know, the sum total of my career between interning while I was at Pepperdine to when I decided to leave Hollywood altogether, that was, you know, eight years in total. In those eight years, I saw a lot. I experienced a lot and I had great success. And I think it was that hard work ethic that really helped me continue to succeed, as well as my, my ability to connect with people and empathy. But what I, I absolutely felt totally disoriented about was that during this time in Hollywood, it was like the traditional model of making money was cracking. There were these huge fissures in advertising revenue and there was no great solution. And you could kind of hear almost like a train rumbling down the tracks 
the tech industry coming. And it just was this super interesting time. I mean, uh, amongst everything else, I was working with some of the greats. John Landgraf at FX Networks was my boss. I mean, that's that's a dream come true. You know, I would do that all over again. But I also was seeing through Kevin's eyes the disruption that was coming. So it was this very, very weird experience where, you know, my day job started to become more about what product placements could we make to try to, you know, generate more revenue and trying to explain that to the creatives. And Kevin, who I was dating at the time, was sending me the first video from his friend Javid's company called YouTube. Right. And I'm sort of like caught in the middle. <laughs> and so I really felt like two things led me to, to decide to leave an otherwise, I think, really promising career and, and totally jump over the other side, which was, I'm completely and entirely motivated and turned on by velocity. So I love to move fast. And, you know, I had chosen cable TV because that's sort of the, that was the fastest moving channel and mechanism to bring entertainment to people. And the second thing was that as I looked across sort of, the opportunities for disruption. It just seemed like the, the, the cards were entirely stacked on the tech side. And I wanted to be a part of that revolution, not the disrupted. I'm really right. happy how things have worked out for FX, by the way. It's like, you know, it's incredibly exciting. I'm not surprised. So I think that would have been an incredible journey to be on. But Kevin really got in and sort of at just the right moment in time, pitched me this idea of working on Eventbrite or what became Eventbrite. And um, I can't tell you what I was thinking when I said yes. I, I really I think I've blacked out that moment in my life. But I was 25. <laughs> and so, you know, you why, take risks. <laughs> why events? So I had worked on a show that never made it to air that was all about, it was a docu-series about fandoms. And it, it, completely, it just captured me because feeling that energy of these fandom events and these conventions and gatherings was life altering. So I would go out and like go to the, it was really kind of off, you know, like the Star Trek conventions and the Klingon convention. And there was a lot, we won't go into all of them. <laughs> but, okay. But I'm, I'm yeah, getting a feel. I'm getting a feel. <laughs> so, there was a lot. Um, but it just, it was actually the commonality of that energy of people connecting in real life, not being anything that we could actually capture and recreate entirely on the screen, right? So that stuck in my head. For Kevin, it was democratizing an industry using microtransactions, which had been his entire entrepreneurial journey until then. He was a seed investor in PayPal. He then built a company on the PayPal API called Zoom, X-O-O-M, which helps people send money back to their families better, faster, cheaper than Western Union. And Renault, our co-founding, our third co-founder and co-founding CTO is a professional photographer. And so he was really interested in helping people turn their passion into profession. So we all kind of came at it from totally different angles. And, you know, it just, it just sort of clicked. It was like, there isn't anything that you could use that's as easy as Gmail to sell tickets to any kind of event. Right. Right. And you weren't the CEO at first, but then there was a moment where, you know, Kevin wants to step <laughs> back. Right. And yeah. and the question is, what do you want to do? Um, what, what was the process that you went through that the board went through in you becoming CEO? Well, I, I make I make light of it, uh, but it was a hard time. I mean, we are we're such an exceptional operating couple on all levels. It's it, we kind of you know, I remember I remember when we went out to we bootstrapped the company, so we were building the company with our own money for the first two years. We spent less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in those first two years to get to scale. We raised um, our first institutional round in two thousand nine, and I remember when we were in that process, you know, there weren't a lot of great examples of how couples had started companies together and either stayed together or the company had succeeded. So we needed to sort of cut our own 
form out of the cloth. And we would go to every meeting and start the meeting with, here are our operating principles and here are our priorities and here's what we're going to do if things go badly. Like here's our, here's our personal exit strategy. And I think that just was really different, you know, for the VCs to hear. And so I think it helped calm the nerves around this. This was like a big no, no. Um, so I'm really proud of that. And I think that 10 years later, when Kevin was in a position where he felt like he needed to step back, you know, to really prioritize his own health, I had that moment where I needed to raise my hand and not because the board didn't have faith in me. Obviously, they unanimously voted me in as CEO, but because I needed to sort of step up and, and express this desire and belief that I could be the right leader for the next 10 years of Eventbrite Plus. How did, how did that desire and belief emerge? A uh, unless it had been part of a plan all along, I can't imagine that you're kind of like <laughs> waiting oh, yeah. in the wings <laughs> thinking, hey, <laughs> once I get rid of this guy, right? Because you're married. So at, at what point did you did you go, okay, no, I, I can do this. And a matter of fact, I'll be good at it. Well, I had spent 10 years under the mentorship of Kevin, frankly. I mean, while he is fully product focused, I am fully people focused, and we built the company together with Renault. So at the end of the day, I had learned directly from one of the greats. And, you know, it just so happens that he's also my husband. And this isn't at all rainbow. And I'm giving you obviously the sort of rainbow version right now. There have been plenty of challenging times. But, you know, you hear of great founding teams, and we are one of those greats. And so I really had this this experience, not only from learning from Kevin, but also learning from greats like Roloff both at, at Sequoia. You know, I mean, I've been under his mentorship for uh, more than a decade now, and I'm the sponge. So I knew that I had learned a lot. Having the confidence to do it was another thing. And the, that was my personal board of directors, particularly one person, and in, in, in specifically Jana Rich, who is an executive recruiter, looked me straight in the eye and said, you need to be the CEO of your own company. Hmm. And what was, you know, what was the conversation? The right time? <laughs> what was the conversation that led to that statement? Were you questioning it? Um, was it unsolicited? Had she been hired to find a CEO? Well, I was, I was letting her in on this very early news that Kevin would be stepping back to prioritize his health. And I felt like that was a family decision. So, you know, I'm his partner and need to be a part of that. But it also was a business decision because this is, you know, this isn't, we're not a small company at this point. And, you know, it, it seemed to be the best time to make this transition strategically and in the, in the sort of growth cycle of the company. And so I started to, to, to see that idea for her that we may be looking for a new leader and she stopped me in my tracks. And so, you know, it made me take a step back and do some, some really deep thinking about what the business needed and objectively as a founder, what I would expect from the next leader. And then I took that to the board and, and truly, you know, it's an independent board. So we, we, I seeded the idea and then stepped back. I mean, we couldn't, Kevin and I are so careful about those types of things because that's the, that's one of the things that you really need to make sure of if you want to have good governance and a great run company and you are family members, you need to be very clear about where to draw the lines. And we had gotten really good at that over a decade. So we just, we left it in the board's hands. And I think they, you know, took some time to really be mindful about what they expected for the company and what I brought to the table. And as well as the gaps, right? I was a first time CEO. And so there are things that I hadn't seen. We wanted to take the company public. That's an extra added challenge to the story, right? And at the end of the day, they chose the person they felt like would move mountains to make this company a success. Indeed, um, makes a lot of sense. And which leads to, I, I always like to ask about what I call Death Valley. Um, lowest point career-wise, because I think there's a lot to to learn from that. Was there a point um, in any stage of this journey when you felt, well, this is it, um, this isn't going to work, or you know, maybe I don't have what it takes to follow through on whatever uh, project or task was in front of you, and you thought, 
um, you might have to do something totally different. I mean, I can say to probably the day, uh, it, was, it was a day in March of last year uh, where, you know, it just, the sky was absolutely falling. And I think I'm, I'm a really great wartime CEO. I didn't, I didn't realize it in March. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> you know, I was having a moment of, I remember a board member said to me at our board dinner in February, you're about to be a wartime CEO. And I thought, huh? You know, like you're in the back of your head, you're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm ready. But you're in the back of your head, you're like, oh gosh, because everything about me is on the surface peacetime. I'm great mm -hmm. at cultivating, you know, culture and branding and growth and, you know, and nobody had seen the other side. <laughs> Not even Except me. the people who watched you dance and, and, and knew that when the pressure is on, that's when yeah. you take it to 11, right? You're right. You're right. And so my own inner voice was like, can I do this? And, you know, I mean, I'm I'm so grateful that, you know, A, I'll, I'll kind of capstone the, the, the Kevin story. He's, he's healthy and strong and such a huge advocate of our business and the most amazing chairman I think I could I could ever ask for because he dropped everything set this room up like a war room I, I remember coming home from Sydney I was the last person in the office I just felt like I needed to be the last person to make sure everybody got their stuff and got out it felt like that disaster you know movie and uh, I gave our CFO a hug and I came home and I just was bottomed out and, and this was in mid-march you know and I walked in and this whole room was this like 360 degree monitor room with whiteboards and i mean i just at that point i realized i was gonna do it i was gonna do it alongside one of the greats and i was gonna i was i was gonna learn something entirely new and it turns out that i'm i'm really great in a crisis <laughs> so it just, I, I think something so, i feel like i'm patting myself a lot on the back but it's like that's something i didn't know about myself well sometimes sometimes you have to um so that that moment is that the day when you had to decide or at least inform the staff everybody clear out we're going remote and you know probably spoken or unspoken a, a lot of people who are working here won't be working here uh pretty soon yeah i mean i think you know we announced our our layoffs on april 8th so quite quite early and that was strategic i wanted to get everybody who we were going to be parting ways with, who were fantastic. And we had to lay off half of our company. And this was not a choice. This was not a sliding scale. <laughs> this was this was a absolutely have to with this, with you know, what we could see in the business and the foreseeable future. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to do it once and never do it again. And I wanted to get everybody who we were going to be parting ways with back out into the job market because I had no idea how many companies would be laying people off. And it was incredible because by the end of that day, so we, we announced it in the morning. We then had every single person who was affected have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone, which was no small feat. This was 500, over 500 people within wow. 24 hours globally. And with that, we offered our own recruiting team to be their personal recruiter. So we started to match recruiters to Brightlings who are going to be leaving. And then what what we what surprised us is that the ex Brightlings, the alumni community who have worked at Eventbrite over the years, crowdsourced their own Google spreadsheet of where they were working and what jobs were open. And we had a hundred companies by the end of the day. And so this is not something you want to be good at. It's not something you want to do again. But gosh, like a lot of who we are came out in the in that first 24 hours. And it was it was it was human. Right. So I was proud of how we showed up in that moment. But it was horrific. And I think that between the time that we had, that was about two weeks after we'd gone home. Right. We'd gone to work, work from home where some people were a little confused based on where they were in the world, why we were shutting the office. And just so much happened in a condensed amount of time. And if I could do it all over again, I would not have changed how quickly we moved. I think that was really the yeah. right choice based on what people, how they needed to be landing in new jobs quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and very often I find that whatever it is that brings you through that Death Valley experience becomes, you know, for leaders, for managers, a tool in the toolbox that they continue to use. So what was your takeaway? What's the core belief that brought you through that experience? And uh, do you continue to lean on it? Yeah, it's really that that she who has the highest conviction wins. <laughs> and she who persists the longest wins. I mean, it's it's not, you know, it's, it's certainly there are, are critical decisions to be made. But if you're anchored around the right things, and I had this incredible support system, you know, that, that really kept me upright and kept checking me on making sure, you know, on helping me make the right decisions. But I think the, the decisions weren't hard to make. It was just we had to go through the hardest path, and that was the right thing. And having that conviction that we could get through it, I think, was the fuel for, you know, doing something that sort of no one ever wants to do in their career. Sure, sure. Um, tell me what's next. Right now, um, we are trying to come out of a pandemic, but not coming out of it as quickly as perhaps we thought we were a couple of months ago, which I guess makes your business at one level challenging to plan at least for the next six to 12 months. But even as you start to open up beyond that and think uh, beyond 12 months, three years from now, how is the event going to be digitized, at least in the, the process of inviting, publicizing, ticketing, paying? Uh, what are the both opportunities and challenges that you see that your whole e ecosystem is going to have to face? Well, I really think that the last quarter, you know, Q2 is truly a bellwether for the early recovery that we'll continue to see as restrictions ease and cases lower, right? So I think that that's a reason to believe that live experiences are going to have this big boom moment. It absolutely is going on longer than any of us would have hoped. And most certainly we know that humans need to connect in real life. I mean, this is, this is part of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's not something that we can go without. And I think this has solidified our core purpose around social isolation. I mean, that is how we started the, the talk. It's, it's become so much more prominent and so much more critical for us as a society to really attend to. And so we see Eventbrite as that ultimate enabler to make the people who, for their for their businesses, for their livelihood, the ones who provide that antidote to social social isolation, really succeed. Now, you know, for us as a business, everything we've done in the last year and a half has set us up for this moment. We're we're faster, leaner, profitable, flexible. We're development focused. We are pushing product out at a faster rate. So I think that we've been able to really accelerate our strategic direction. I think the creator community as a whole, as it, as it relates to live experiences, is also showing a huge amount of resilience. I was just on the phone with, with our customers last week and you know, the lead up to the earnings call, I really wanted to talk to the people that we, you know, we share their stories in our shareholder letter. And I, I like to hear their voices and hear their stories. And all of them had a sort of sheer will of, hey, I've had to adapt my business multiple times over the last year. I I'm going to be okay. I know how to do this now, and I don't have any fear. I mean, you know, that type of spirit and conviction is something that I think is going to help the live experience economy, especially within our realm, right? These small to medium-sized businesses and the independent venues and creators, I think it's going to help them thrive. I certainly see an emerging trend where creators now have two audiences to tend to. Not only are they producing unique and local events, so this is our bread and butter, like the author reading at your local bookshop, the yoga workshop over the weekend with friends, the food festival, you know, in your favorite park. But they're also taking their content now and they're able to deliver it to a global audience online in a separate event. It's not like they're trying to stream the same event or do it synchronously. I'm seeing an asynchronous hybrid model emerge that allows Eventbrite to know, okay, th these are places that we can help them succeed. We can help creators 
price their tickets appropriately. We can help creators expand their audience, which is what we've, we've done through COVID. And we just brought to, to market a new product that helps them market their event more successfully. Uh, about 40% of the face value of a ticket is spent on marketing the event. And we believe that we have the data and the tools to help them spend that much more wisely and see a greater return. So it's also opened up new opportunities for Eventbrite the business. And so right. in the future, if you look out like three years, I mean, you never, never underestimate the human spirit of gathering and also knowing what it feels like to have something taken away from us. I think we'll be going through a roaring era of gathering. And I think that we'll have a totally new medium to connect with global audiences through live events. I mean, that, that, that fuels my excitement, even in the darkest of days. Yeah. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be going fast again. Um, I know you like to go fast. So, uh, so we're all looking forward to that and doing it together, doing it in person. Uh, Julia, it's been uh, a great conversation. I appreciate everything that you shared about your own journey and about Eventbrite as well. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed it.